assuming the right people are all there, we, we, we will start. I, I'm very happy that we have this opportunity to, to welcome Rebecca. Um, she's uh, a confirmed uh, speaker, of course, and she's the co-founder of the Global Impact Alliance uh, and of the sustainability map, uh, future maps, um, which is characterized as the trip advisor for sustainability in your city. So maybe she tell us a little bit more about that. And uh, her research is uh, very much on uh, inner skills and the right mindset for transformation, which also resonates with uh, what Initiatives of Change is uh, trying to, to do and trying to say. Um, so I'm, I must say, we feel that uh, there is a, a, a certain kinship there. So Rebecca, if you would like to, to start, uh, we have now 10 participants um, and we are recording, of course, the session. So uh, and one, one or two uh, people who couldn't come um, express the wish already to see the, the presentation, so we, they will be able to do so. So Rebecca, please. Yes. Thank you, Antoine. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody from all over the world. It's a pleasure to speak to you and with you today about um, the most interesting findings that I've found so far. I've been working on the field of sustainability for over 10 years now. And um, last year, uh, this summer, I was in Co Palace again, after 12 years, actually, I did an internship training there. And this was kind of my kickoff where I looked for change in the outer world, but also in later on now in the inner world. And then going back to Co again, I found this beautiful <laughs> symbiosis of coming together finally. So um, I would like, I have a presentation and I would like to start with a quiz with you today. It's a short quiz on the state of the world, actually. I have three questions prepared. And each question has three answers, A, B, C. And I would like you to write your answer into the shed. Like just, just write A or B or C. What you intu intuitively think is the right answer. So uh, let me start my presentation with a quiz. Um, all right. So here comes the first, uh, the first question. Over the last 20 years, the proportion of people living in extreme poverty in relation to the global population has A, almost doubled, B, has remained about the same, or C, almost half. So you have five or 10 seconds now to write in the chat, is it A, B, or C? Please put it now. We have three times C, we have one B. Is there more questions, is there more answers? Okay, it's C again also. <laughs> There's one A. All right. So the majority is, uh, has voted for C and actually it's right. <laughs> the right answer is C. Let's turn, let's go to the second question, which is what is the average life expectancy worldwide today? Is it 50 years or is it 60 or is it 70? A, B or C again, please write down your answer right now. We have a B, we have a C, we have 70. Mm -hmm. Some more, some more ideas. All right. Yeah. Okay. We have a little bit of B, but also many say it's C, and that's actually also the right answer. Very. You're very good. Let's go to the last question. How has the number of deaths caused by natural disasters each year changed over the last 100 years? Has that number more than doubled, has remained the same, or has it more than half? Now it's your turn again to put in the chat A, B, or C.
Okay, here we got a lot of A's. But the correct answer here is C again, it has half. Now, this is a really interesting audience because whenever I do the quiz, and I've been doing it now for a year actually, doing presentations in any circumstances with, uh, with entrepreneurs, change makers, students, no matter, no matter where I am, we always, 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 always tend to um, perceive the world more negatively than the world is by fact. Now here I was really surprised in a, in a positive way that you and the majority of you has put the right answers for at least the first two questions, which is already the exact mindset that I'm looking for. And this just makes me even more happy to work with you today. <laughs> Because in my 10 years of, of, of working in the field of sustainability, be it at the United Nations or a, be it as a unit teacher or be it as a co-founder, it's always that I was wondering what is stopping us from making a sustainable transformation possible when it is possible from a financial and technical point of view, right? And the more I dig deeper into that question, the more I came to the conclusion that it's actually us ourselves that we are standing in our own way in a way. It's the mindset, it's the negative mindset that we focus so much on what is not working and what is stopping us. So this is one part, but there's also another part of the mindset that is hindering us and that is our linear view of the future. We find it really hard to have a room for disruption, to have a room for big change to happen. We perceive the future a little better or a little less good than today. Just give me one, let me give you one picture from how people perceive the future 100 years ago. Artists in Paris were supposed to draw the future in the year 1900. How should the future of mobility look like in the year 2000, for example? And it's really interesting how much that picture is not really future, but so much actually the past. So how open are we actually to look into the future? And what is the medicine that can help us to, um, to, come, o to come over it? I was thinking about that a lot and I was thinking, well, of course, we can surround ourselves with solutions, with the, op with the optimistic people, with uh, the people who work on concrete solutions and all the achievements that we have done so far. So I was doing exactly that. I was drawing down together with a think tank, I was drawing down all our achievements that we made so far in the field of sustainability. And that's amazing, right? Because we are not only talking about sustainability since five years, since it's kind of on vogue to talk about it. No, pioneers have been building this path for more than a lot of centuries, uh, <laughs> decades, sorry. And as we can see here, actually, one achievement and one success is building up on another one. So uh, if, if there's a huge societal topic um, because maybe a huge NGO is pushing it, it may soon become a public discourse and that public discourse then becomes a law or a political regulation. And that in turn, and that in turn will, um, will promote economic innovation as well. What I found surprising here as well is that the turnout was actually the form of a wave. And this is why I love to talk so much about the transformation wave that we are in right now. And within that wave, you have certain catalysts. So it's not only that the wave is building up upon each success and achievement actually, but it is that we have magic points, catalysts, that will kind of explode the whole wave in a way that sustainable innovation will diffuse in a huge way. How is that? I'm talking about positive tipping points here. 
And again, at this point, people will ask me positive tipping points. I only know the negative in our climate. And maybe is that another symptom of our negative thinking society? I don't know. But why can't we make use of the same dynamic in a positive way, I was wondering. So I was again digging deeper into that topic and I found it super surprising. Unfortunately, there's only very little literature on it. I, to be honest, I found only three huge studies that um, really make sense. But let me give you the essence of what I found. So when it comes to the diffusion of innovation, and I'm sure you may know this curve because we use it a lot when it comes to the diffusion of a certain product on a market, for example, we always use the S curve to explain the diffusion. And with the S curve, you can see that it, at the beginning, you have quite a while of, the S curve stays quite low for a long time, actually, in the beginning until there's one point where the S-curve goes up rapidly, exponentially, you could even say. And that point, of course, is our tipping point. It is the point where the innovation that you want to bring forward will diffuse almost automatically, without much more effort, actually. And that diffusion, uh, that innovation could be either way a technical innovation or it can also be a behavioral innovation like eating less meat or taking the bike, but it could also be the diffusion of electric vehicles or renewable energy. If this is about a change within society, the tipping point is at about more or less 25%. And this is for me one of the greatest lessons that we can learn from that dynamic, which is we can use our very worthy resources in a very effective way because it means we have to concentrate only on the first 25 percent of people that are most open to our innovation we can forget about climate deniers anyway so this is one this is one and i would like to give you another picture to to really make it stuck in your mind and your and your being Imagine the change that you want to bring about is a ball and that ball needs to be rolled up a hill. And of course, that part of the way is the hardest that we have to take. Rolling up a ball up a hill is the hardest work. That means reaching the first 25% of society is the biggest job that we have to do. And it's the job where we need all kinds of forces from any side, that means from any group of society, uh, to push up that ball. And of course, during that way, it can also happen that we have backlashes, so the ball may roll down again. But if we are strong enough, we can keep the ball up to that hill. Why? Because we know once the ball is up on the peak of the hill, which is the tipping point, it just needs a small dip and the ball will roll down itself. It will roll down effortlessly. That means from that tipping point onwards, the change will diffuse among society almost automatically. It will not need as much effort as we have put in before. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, let me. Oh yeah, I even no. I will go. Let me. Let me. Let me go into a concrete example, because I thought, you know, it's it is science uh, that I'm talking about, and it's a theory. So I felt like it's one of the greatest knowledge that has a lot of power that we can make use of, but we have to bring life to it. So what I'm doing now for a year is going around and try to bring life to that model, to that theory. And I'm also looking for, to forward to do that with you today. The theory of positive tipping point, how, where can it be applied to? I was wondering. And of course, the studies show me that it can be applied to the energy system. Interestingly, the tipping point of the energy system is very straightforward. It's actually the price 
So, of course, when fossil fuels will become more expensive, it does not make sense to use them anymore. And that's actually the tipping point for, um, for, for the renewable energy to take over the energy system. But it's not always the price. Um, the tipping point is really hard to calculate, actually. But the question is, us, for us as change maker, how can we actually get there? How can we reach the 25%? And I found only one study that uh, gives us a hint, that gives us the condition to go there. And I would like to go through these conditions right now. Um, but I would also like you to apply these conditions for your own case. And here we come back to the question, where can it be applied? It can be applied to a system level as the energy system in your country or globally. But I also found out that it can be applied to an organizational level. Uh, last week, I was working with an organization, a social, um, a social business in Germany that is working on bringing agriculture to children. So their idea is to uh, bring gardens into schools and kindergartens so that uh, children learn again how a carrot is growing right uh, actually i was just there and we made a picture it's about making <laughs> making your hands dirty again right like this is their motto and they want to reach they want to make this as a concrete part of the educational program and and their tipping point they reached already 10% of all schools in Germany, but their tipping point would actually be to reach 30 to 40%. And they also created conditions how to get there. I can tell you a little bit more later, but I just want you to think right now, where am I part of a transformation wave? Like which kind of transformation wave am I surfing? Where is, am I part of a critical mass? Mm. So as I said, it can be a, your organizational tipping point. It can be also um, a societal or system tipping point. Mm. Maybe it's, it's also an NGO. Whatever you are engaging yourself in right now, where is your tipping point to diffuse whatever you want to spread? So... Now, the study that I'm going to talk about is actually a study that looked at the diffusion of less meat in the diet. And here again, um, they said, okay, we want to reach 25% of Europeans that have a diet that ha contains only little, little meat. So the question is, how do we get there? And now, if you look at the blue box here, we will zoom in into that right now. Oh. It looks, it may look, it may look like a lock, but it's the most interesting part actually of all of this, because it gives us the five conditions to reach a, a tipping point in a transformation. And it also gives us already a little hint about the typical backlashes that we can experience in, in that way. Um, the, the, the conditions, um, let me go through the conditions and I will give you a little example of them. Um, and later on, when we break out into groups uh, in a few minutes, it's about you to define your conditions for your tipping point, but also what are possible backlashes and what could be countermeasures to incorporate them right from the beginning. So let's all imagine we would like to spread um, the idea that we have a diet that has only little meat um, in Europe. What about the performance? Okay, performance here means that the alternative pro pro products have at least the same taste, the same texture, maybe it's even same easy to use, right? Um, many people, you know, I'm also vegetarian and many people ask me, why is there now an industry that has to bring up mm, 
vegetarian protein that has the same form as a, of a sausage? Well, because most people are used to sausages, they know they put them on barbecue. They know how to. They know how long it should be on on the grill. So that is kind of the performance. Will clients come back and consume that alternative product actually because it convinced them by their performance? And then there will happen social contagion. That means, okay, I'm going to my neighbor and tell them, you know, I tried that. It's yummy. Let, let's, let's buy it again for a new next barbecue party. And then, of course, there's the price. And that's always the most tricky one because in our society, in our governments, we still have a lot of subsidies that actually works against our alternative products, right? We have a lot of subsidies that still goes to fossil fuel or that still in, in Europe, we, we still have a lot of subsidies that support um, conventional meat production um, instead of organic organic stuff and even marketing there's a lot of marketing that goes into um supporting uh meat meat products for example um so price really also of course makes sense when you have the effect of scaling your product um that means when the demand is higher of course also that has an effect on your price um convenience is about um Convenience is about how easy is it actually to use your alternative? How comfortable can I be in just, you know, using it? And that has a lot of um, a lot to do with nudging. Um, probably, you know, nudging, right? It's about uh, making the, cho the, the choice easy to use. So when you go to a restaurant, uh, the vegetarian option, are easy to read when you go into a supermarket the vegetarian options are easy to see right at the eyesight um so so that is about convenience that uh, it's it's easy to use and to choose from um yeah so that would be that condition and then there comes the condition of cultural norms and um that is sometimes tricky and hard to change right Cultural norms are, for example, prejudices about becoming vegan or vegetarian. Um, it's a, I lately heard a sentence saying, oh, if, if you're a man and you're vegan, you're not male enough. Like, like these are prejudices and cultural norms in our head that we have to overcome. But cultural norms is also language. And in Europe, we, had, um, we have a new regulation that forbids our um, oat milk to call themselves milk because it's not milk. <laughs> so they have to say oat drink, but um, officially it's not milk. And language makes a lot with us, right? So cultural norms, um, making it cool, making, making the better party for your alternative is what we have to achieve in terms of cultural norms for our innovation. And then comes the point of capability, which is basically, am I able to make use of that new alternative? Am I able to cook a new dish um, that is vegetarian or that is made of lentils or whatever? Um, are the chefs in the hotel able to make a vegetarian burger? I just heard that um, Hilton has, has has a new training for their chefs to be able to, 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 to do that veggie burger, actually, and not only meat burger. So we have to train people for that new innovation. Um, we have to uh, spread information or be um, an example and lead by example to see how it works, how to use that innovation. So these are the five um, five conditions. And we also have backlashes all the time, of course, that we have to incorporate into our strategy. But I would say once we are aware of what our conditions could look like and how we can confront our backlashes, we are able to design a strategy to reach our own tipping point. And this is exactly where I would like to go with you today. Tipping point, we talked about levels, <laughs> just one more story. Last week I was giving a presentation and a guy came up to me and said, what about the personal level actually? And I said, well, do you have any idea for a personal tipping point? 
And he said, well, yes, I'm trying to meditate, but it's really hard for me to make it a habit. And then I realized, well, yes, of course, you can also put tipping points actually on a personal level. Um, we all know that, you know, if you want to make a habit out of it, you have to make it at least for 40 days. So maybe the 40 days are exact, exactly the way where you have to push up, push up the ball. Mm, so wherever you think about tipping points, no matter at which level, uh, you are free to do so. And yeah, I would say we would break up into groups right now, right, Antoine? And I prepared a mirror link where we would then collect the conditions of our tipping points. But there is somebody raised a hand. So can we open the room for questions first before before we break up into rooms, Antoine? Yes, sure. Um, people need to activate. John is already activated, so he can probably ask his question now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, the circles that you've got on over performance, are they is, are each of those um, those four points repeated in each of the following circles? Mm. So is it always economies mm. of scale, information, etc., in each one, or are they yes. different? Mm. Yeah, good question. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is exactly. Uh, so this, this is the containing feedback, the positive feedback loops of that. Um, of that innovation. And it's a good question that you asked that economy of scale, information flow learning by doing a positive experience are part of the elements, but I would say it's not always exactly like that. Uh, let me give you one example for another positive feedback loop. Um, let's say we created great conditions to, to have a higher demand in electric vehicles. So maybe we may, we have some governmental initiatives and the media maybe played a role and also the economy played a role because we have a, a nice choice actually these days and also a good price. So we have made good conditions for the electric vehicle to be bought uh, in a higher in a higher um, realm. Um, and that means the cost of production of batteries will decrease. And that means also that the electric vehicle price will decrease as well. And that means the demand of electric vehicles will become um, higher. Uh, so that would be a positive feedback loop. But we also have a different dynamic at work as well, which is really interesting. Um, I said the cost of production of batteries will de decrease and that will affect actually also a lower price of batteries for our energy for the for the energy net for our energy system, which in, then actually will have a domino effect on the tipping point of our tipping point in the energy system. And this is something and then imagine we have lower costs of uh, renewable energies, which will then in turn actually make the cost of charging your electric vehicle even lower as well. And that again would lead to higher demand of electric vehicles. So we have a lot of increasing or positive feedback loops at work actually, once we reach those tipping points. Great, now we have Steve, you have uh, your hand up as well. Thanks so much. Um, and thanks for all of this, Rebecca. Fascinating. Um, I, I believe you just answered this question using the energy sector as a model. But just taking this um, meat um, and sort of planetary health diet into consideration, that tipping point, I'm assuming, would look fairly similar, that the price of vegetarian related products would go down that the adoption rate might continue to rise. I just I'm I'm trying to extrapolate this curve to to think about what the what the next step in this curve is. It is the goal to ultimately have more people driving electric cars and eating vegetarian diets is the goal sort of this general model of sustainability that all of these tipping points are leading us towards. Is that sort of the point? Hmm. 
I would say the goal is that in each system that we have, <laughs> the sustainable alternative takes over, is like dominating. Um, um, sorry. So, but but I mean, what what the goal is is in the end also a question of society and of yourself, right? What do you think? What do you believe should the world look like? Um, so I have one more. Uh, let me show you this slide. Um, <laughs> It comes from the latest uh, UN report, actually. And this is about what I believe is happening right now. Uh, here we see the S curve again, right? But a different direction. We see the green line that is for the rise of sustainable systems in the S shape. And at the same time happens the decline of the unsustainable system. So super easy example is always the energy system where we want to bring up renewable and we want to break down fossil fuels um what i find so um kind of uh, <laughs> soothing in this in a way is that it shows us that the especially in the first phase the first of the emergence of the new system and the first phase of the destabilization of the old system is in a very shaky way because you have a lot of impediments and levers for each um especially a lot because of lobby lobbyism actually and my, what, what mm -hmm. the experience i made um but this is exactly the time we're living in and this is why we get so confused about all these different news we are we are hearing oh they're building uh, new coal power plants but here the en the renewable energy price is at the lowest point ever you know we have this shape we are in the shaky phase right now and we are unable to really imagine that future that is about to come because of our linear thinking, because we underestimate these that so-called magic tipping points that will bring us the change in a very rapid way. Thank you so much. That's that it's helpful to put this all into that that <laughs> perspective that these tipping points come and they lead to a, a next phase in, in a process. And yeah, I, I'm excited about this.